So the lessons are understand mission, um, be open to work and don't let your aspirations be defined by others and mm. what they may think of as a bad word. And listen when other people say they see and hear something in you. Um, and that's a very short version of how I got to this point today. Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I'm your host, Mamta Akapati. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of student to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by Simplicity. A true partner, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life with techno technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast for more information about our sponsor. So, as I mentioned, I'm Mumta Akapati. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am broadcasting from Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is situated on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Humanos, Coahuiltecan, Comanche, Lipan Apache, and Tonkawa peoples. So, friends, in full confession, I have been a huge fan of President Hinton for quite some time. <laughs> Her ability to lead with humility, care, and a student-centered approach has been a great in inspiration for me. Dr. Ma Mary Dana Hinton became the 13th president of Hollins University on August 1st, 2020. Previously, she was the president of the College of St. Benedict from 2014 to 2020. President Hinton is a member of the Board of Directors for the American Association of Colleges and Universities, AACNU, Interfaith Youth Corps, St. Mary's School, and the Teagle Foundation. She's currently serving a three-year term as an at-large board member with the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, NICU. She chairs the AACNU President's Trust and is also a member of the Lumina Foundation's Quality Credentials Task Force. President Hinton speaks frequently in the United States and abroad on topics related to the liberal arts and inclusion, and she founded the Liberal Arts Illuminated Conference. Hinton teaches in the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education Doctoral Program in Higher Education Management and the Council of Independent Colleges President's Institute New President Program. My friends, we would be talking about President Hinton's accomplishments throughout the entirety of the podcast, if I didn't stop now. Um, so there is no introduction that oh. adequately honors President Hinton's impact on her communities and in higher education overall. You all are in for a treat oh, today. <laughs> you are too generous, Mamda. Thank you. That oh. was lovely and overly generous. And you bring good people to you. Your light oh. and your energy that you put out into the world draws, I think, the best out of others. So I'm delighted oh to be with you today this, as well. This is such a treat. So it's such a gift, again, to be with you. And so <laughs> just um, for the listeners who haven't Googled you in the way that I have, <laughs> and for, for, you know, and of course, there's, you know, an, an, an infinity of spirit experiences and lived experience journeys that you have to offer can you um, just briefly share your journey into higher education leadership uh, with us? Yeah, you know, I we are less than a week past commencement here at Holland University, um, which is located in Roanoke, Virginia, where Women's College and um, it's less than a week past commencement. It's the day before reunion. So I've been thinking a lot about trajectories and paths and pathways. And some might say I had a fairly traditional higher ed pathway, um, I, but I don't really view it that way. So mm -hmm. the first half of my career was actually in K-12. Wow. Um, I was a school developer for many years. I helped folks start businesses. I did philanthropic work on that side. And so when I got to higher ed, I was well into my career. Um, and I think that that experience in K-12 really helped shape my leadership, um, my leadership agenda, if you will, in higher education. And what I mean by that is 
I think it's so important to not just think about one's own institution and one's own sphere of influence, but you have to realize that the work that we do in higher ed is inextricably linked to what happens in K-12. And yes. I think it's inextricably linked to what people go off into jobs and careers and lives and what they do there. So I try to view my higher ed work as a steward of a particular time and a particular place. And for me, that time and place started at Misericordia University. Um, my, yeah, in oh, Dallas, yeah. Pennsylvania. <laughs> it is a lovely place founded by the Religious Sisters of Mercy. Um, to whom I owe a debt of gratitude that I can barely articulate. The Religious mm -hmm. Sisters of Mercy taught me about a charism and what it means to live mission. And wow. again, I would say that was the first higher ed building block yeah. that really settled in my in my heart, um, that your mission determines what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. It guides your trajectory, and it is the place where you get to reflect your deep care for a community. So my first contract in higher ed, uh, Mamta, was actually one year. Wow. And I tried to negotiate for a <laughs> two-year contract. And they said, no, you get one year. It was one year. Wow. Half-time multicultural student advisor, half-time faculty member. Wow. And, um, and I said to my board chair at the nonprofit, I was leaving to go take this one-year contract. I said, you know, I, I'll be back. I, I promise I'll be back. I only have a year, but I really want to flex this new PhD and yes. see what it's like. And I fell in love. I mean, that's, that's it. I fell in love with higher education. I love the students. I love the work. I even love the challenges. I was saying to one of my board committees this morning, I love the challenges that we are confronting in higher ed right now, because it's going to make us have to be better. And in order for higher ed to be better, all of us leaders are going to have to do better and be better ourselves. And I love that. So that's how I got into higher ed. I, I think because I had had this career, this administrative career before higher ed, right. um, I think it came naturally for me to settle into some administrative roles. I didn't know that was a bad word. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't know. I thought, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I get to help. <laughs> Silly me. Um, and I just, it just went from there. And uh, some people believed in me. And um, even when I didn't believe in myself, and those people convinced me eventually to apply for presidencies. And here I am. So the lessons are understand mission. Um, be open to work and don't let your aspirations be defined by others and mm. what they may think of as a bad word and listen when other people say they see and hear something in you. Um, mm. And that's a very short version of how I got to this point today. Oh my gosh, what a what a gift. This was the, the gift that I didn't know that I was going to need so deeply today. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hear you and, you know, I, I love this, this concept of, um, mission beyond position, right? And so yeah. it sounds like you've been on a journey and you've been, um, you know, always discerning a, of mission along any kind of experience that you've had. And I really love that reminder because I think sometimes we can very specifically think about the positions we have and maybe mm -hmm. miss that greater perspective of what is my mission, you yeah. know, in, in, a, in a grander scheme. And so thank you so much for that yeah. um, invitation. Yeah. And then the and other thing, I, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think there are two yeah. missions, and I didn't realize yeah. that until I was a little into my first presidency. So uh -huh. I think for those of us who are faithful to the institutions we serve, I think we know our institutional missions by heart, and that is so important, and, and that is certainly what the Religious Sisters of Mercy emphasized with me, was you've got to embrace the mission, and I think they would say charism of the institution you're serving, which is so important. But it, a, a little while into my leadership as the president of the College of St. Ben's, I began to really think about what is my personal mission? Oh. So what does it mean? What am I called to do? Mm -hmm. What is my purpose? What am I committed to? What are the lines that I have to draw that I won't cross? And then at another level, it was, why is that my mission? And how does understanding that why inform how I live my mission on a daily basis. And as a, as a leader and as someone who likes to work with emerging leaders, I often say, 
the mission of the institution you serve and the mission of your heart, mind, and spirit have to be aligned. Yeah. And if you're not aligned, it's going to be really hard to find success. Um, and we don't all have the same mission or the same calling yeah. or vocation. The world needs us all and it needs yeah. us to live into our missions. And I'm just really grateful that I've been able to find institutions that I wherein there is alignment and where yeah. our missions resonate with one another. Oh, yeah, just uh, so beautiful. And as I think about my next question for you, um, uh, you know, having come from the world of student affairs in my own career, something that I, you know, very much believe has been a core part of my mission, uplifting the sacredness of students, mm -hmm. um, um, as I was kind of sharing with you before we began recording. Right. I, um, you know, the student affairs, student, the student experience work, we're all doing student experience work, is really hard right now. I mean, it's always been hard, but it feels really hard right now. And I have to say, you know, of course, as I as I was learning about you and, and my continued just uh, appreciation for your leadership, uh, I'm always inspired when I see a college president really lift up the student affairs experience. <laughs> um, and your Inside Higher Ed article on reimagining student affairs, uh, it was such a hopeful piece for me. Um, oh, and you. I guess, you know, as, as we're kind of reflecting today, what would you want listeners of this podcast to consider about the student experience today? Mm. Like for any of us who are listening, how might we elevate our work, adjust our energy, any of kind of guidance that you would have? Yeah. On that? Well, I guess there are a few pieces and I, I want to start with gratitude for those folks who have chosen student affairs work. So in that first position that I mentioned mm -hmm. was halftime multicultural student affairs and halftime faculty. And uh, so I, some might say I started in student affairs, um, mm -hmm. that's where the multicultural uh, piece was housed. And I didn't realize, I had gone to school, I had gotten a bachelor's, a master's and a PhD, but I, what I hadn't realized was the entrenched bifurcation that higher mm -hmm. ed insisted upon between mm -hmm. academic affairs and student affairs. And I think that has never served us well. Right. And I think it's a particular hazard and you might get me to argue malpractice for mm -hmm. us to mm -hmm. separate the two in the way we do. I think um, what we know about students today and what I think we've always known but haven't wanted to verbalize, students don't have student affairs and academic affairs on campus. Students come to campus and they have a collegiate experience. Right. And it's made up of all these pieces. And out of a 168 hour week, the majority of their time is not spent in the classroom. Now they spend a lot of time reflecting on the classroom, yep. I hope, debating, reading, preparing, but an awful lot of their time is spent in those spaces that we've, that we've set our student affairs mm -hmm. spaces. And so I've been calling for a student experience as opposed yeah. to student affairs and academic affairs for a long time. And I'll tell you a funny story. I remember the first time <laughs> I was working on a redesign. My first administrative job was director of a core curriculum. And as we always are, it was going through a change. And I said, well, we want to make sure we have student affairs and academic affairs on the committee because when you change the core, you're changing students' experience. Right. So everyone needs to be at the table. And one of my colleagues said in a very serious manner, why are you trying to ruin <laughs> higher education by forcing student affairs and academic affairs to be together? And I thought, I thought that just made sense, right? That we want to think about the student as a whole human being. Um, what I didn't know then and that I use often now is a quote from Learning Reconsidered 2. Now, Learning Reconsidered yeah. 2 is one of my favorite books. Yes. Um, if, if we want to bifurcate, it's <laughs> the student affairs side of things, but it is one of my favorite books. But there's a quote from Learning Reconsidered 2 that says, the holistic process of learning, learning that places the student at the center of the learning experience demands collaboration and collaboration demands cultural change. Yeah. So to some degree, I'm still on this crusade to say, until we recognize that students are the center of our work, mm -hmm. that learning is holistic, 
and that you can't separate student affairs and academic affairs, that that collaboration is essential. I, I will remain on that crusade. And, and so I want folks to know we're in it together. Um, I don't know of an institution that can be successful without a great faculty. And I don't right. know of one that can be successful without a great student affairs or at Hollins, what we call student success team. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. And I think we put up those walls yeah. um, to maintain a status, a caste mm -hmm. system. I, I don't know, mm -hmm. but it's not helpful and it's not based on what students need. Well, and I think, you know, as I hear you reflecting, uh, I have a funny story too. Um, when I worked at Rollins College, um, yeah. which <laughs> our school's name is Florida Ryan, friends. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it, uh, I remember when I was dipping into the world of our regional accrediting body, the Southern Association mm -hmm. of Colleges and Schools, and, and it was interesting, um, if not for the partnership with with our colleague, the associate provost, who coordinated um, all of the right the the work, the preparation work for when our regional accrediting partners come to our campus, and we in student affairs were exempt from submitting learning outcomes um, um, and because it wasn't asked of us, right? It kind of in, in wow. the documentation mm -hmm. materials. I mean, you know, a lot of compliance-based work, which of course we need to submit. And I remember, I, I remember reaching out to my colleague and I was like, I know I need us to submit learning outcomes. Yeah. <laughs> I, th this is important to me. Yeah. And I realized that it's extra work for everybody involved, but we are a learning organization. Right. And it, and it was interesting. And, and that really shifted the culture of how we identified and, and, and elevated our work because we could connect the learning um, to your point. It's, okay. it's how do we have a shared affection of, right. of the learning experience with one another? So your, your story rings. 100%. Mm -hmm. And it is harder now. You're right. I think student affairs, I think some folks went into the business because it was a, a really joyful place to do mm -hmm. work and it's hard now. I mean, it's, yeah. I've been a president for nine years now and mm -hmm. I've watched how the work has changed. There's yeah. still joy, yes. but I, I, I hope that as a sector, we are recognizing that the learning happens all over campus and none yes. of us get to abdicate responsibility for helping students learn. None of us have the right yeah. to say we own it. Right. Our institutions are learning institutions, which means we must be learning in every venue. Yes, absolutely. Um, so of course, reflecting on on your many pieces, um, you know, your other piece that really moved me well was the one that actually prompted me to reach out to you because mm -hmm. it just it 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 hit my soul. Um, it's your piece for AAC and you, um, the work of moral imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are many quotes that I have from this piece, but the one that <laughs> I want to reflect on, or there's two actually, but the first one is um, this idea that imagination allows one to look at one's circumstance and conceive something different, often something more than what the world presents as options. Imagination beckons to your best self. Um, and I just, so, so that was uh, of the many quotes that stuck out to me. And so the question that I have for you is really like, what inspired you to write this powerful piece? Like what, what was going on in your spirit and your mind and heart before yeah. you wrote this piece? So that piece actually, um, came out of my inauguration as oh. the 13th president of Holland University. And the theme of my inauguration was imagination. And there were a few things that prompted that. There, there are words that sometimes get stuck in my heart and I can't get them out. And they, they just, they rattle around and I have to figure out how do I express this word? And it's not just being able to say the word imagination, but what does it mean to try to imagine a community? Yeah. Um, and so... I was thinking about imagination really from two or three key perspectives. One is, um, you know, it, I've been very public about having grown up in a low income family in rural North Carolina and having encountered some real barriers mm -hmm. in terms of access to education. Now, I want to be super clear. I eventually got a very lucky break. Um, and my mission in life is to make sure other young women don't have to hope for a lucky break, but instead that we build systems that allow them to, to be successful. 
But anyway, when I was a kid, all I had was my imagination, right? Like mm -hmm. I could imagine college or I could imagine mm -hmm. a different life. I could imagine not um, wanting for some basic things in life. Um, and I still imagine a lot. I imagine what it will be like when, you know, I see little kids playing, what will it be like for them to be able to go to any college they want yeah. to attend? And how, what's my role in making that happen? I want to imagine for young women, what does it mean to own your voice? Yes. When the world tells you, you don't own your voice. What is that like when you do and when you have that realization? So in many ways, my imagination um, saved me. I could imagine wow. something different when reality was sending one set of messages, when reality is still sending a set mm -hmm. of messages today, when people want to erase your humanity and your history mm -hmm. and your choices, you've got to imagine something different and then mm -hmm. set about doing the work. And to right. me, that is what education does. Higher education should unleash the imagination of the students we serve and say to them, if you can imagine this, let us build the structures and the systems and the supports and the opportunities so that you can then go for it. Yeah. Um, but you, I worry that we curtail imagination Yes. Now that we say, oh, that's a fanciful thing for kids. Yes. And um, it's not. It's what it's what encourages you to change the world. It's what says to you, Mamta, you have something special to offer the world. Mm -hmm. And I believe in that. And I want to create a pathway for yeah. you. Um, so I, to me, there's nothing more important Mm -hmm. that imagination and, and the liberal arts in so many ways Absolutely. uniquely prepares you to shape your imaginings in such a way that it's not just about you as an individual it's about the common good the greater good and dwelling in a community yeah I really feel you know when I hear you talk about imagination I feel like it's this experiencing of an untethering of hope from fear that's right. Right. Oh, that's and beautiful. and so I just uh, it, it really is so inspiring. And and also, you know, coming from, you know, the work that you've done, the work that I, I have done in the past. Um, how do we do that work when our students come to our campuses uh, hungry mm -hmm. um, and they're coming with a different set of life circumstances? Right. So we have, you know, as we see increasing students, you know, that are coming from, you know, systemic and generational yeah. poverty experiences um, or students, um, as, as we think about kind of the, the foundations of anxiety that are, yeah. you know, embedded in our society. I mean, really um, what we're seeing on our campuses are really reflections of kind of what is happening in our society That's overall, right. but how do we steward that? Um, and how do we then adjust our practices to mm -hmm. what our students need now? Like, you know, those I, are such yeah. good questions. I actually think we have to start by acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. I think there's some comfort in us either pretending like that's not students' reality or right. being surprised by it. And mm -hmm. I think we just have to acknowledge that that is reality and that there's yeah. neither blame nor value judgment placed on it. So we are all seeing students struggling coming out of the pandemic. It's not the kids' yeah. fault. It's not yeah. K-12's fault. It's not their parents' fault. It was the pandemic, right? But how yeah. do we say, I know you're going to come in with, with different needs and needs that yeah. are all across the spectrum, right? Like some kids were really able to thrive and yes. some kids couldn't get out of bed. Right. And so we have a responsibility to serve them all. And I think we have to say that. And I think we have to stretch ourselves to meet students where they are. So I think the first step is acknowledging it. I think the second step is when you learn that your students have food insecurity, which we've learned at Holland, you open a food pantry. You don't debate whether or not you should yeah. have to. You don't think about, well, does that change how we're viewed by the world? 
you feed the kid, right? right. I mean, that's what you or, yes. or the adult, that's what you mm -hmm. do, right? right. Um, these are not complicated issues at one level. If you know your students are having housing and security, you find a way to support them. Those are the things that you should do because we're human beings mm -hmm. and we're in this together. Yeah. Then once you've met those basic needs, you encourage folks, you give them hope, you talk about hope. I mm -hmm. mean, that mm -hmm. to me, that word is missing in our yes. lives these Absolutely. days. Mm -hmm. And hope isn't, you know, wishing. Hope is, wow, we need something different. And here, here are the steps I'm going to take. I often talk about hope is a weapon. And I don't generally use that sort of yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. example or frame of reference, but it is a weapon mm -hmm. because if you take hope away from people, all mm -hmm. they have left is fear and yes. you see just chaos and disruption. Absolutely. So, but if you give people hope, they can mm -hmm. do nearly anything. And, and I believe that quite strongly. So, um, so I think we have to give young people hope. We, we have to let them know that they can do things and their path may not be the same as my path, but as long as we're on the path together, we can, we can do anything. And, and I guess the final thing I'll add about that is, and I, my students, faculty and staff at Hollins hear me say this all the time, the issues are so complicated today mm -hmm. and the barriers are many and the challenges are numerous. So at the end of the day, the one thing I know I can do is love you. Mm -hmm. And so I hope to, and, and I'm working on a piece about this, mm -hmm. to use love as yeah. a way of, as a tool or as a type of leadership, because it's a really complicated moment right now. But if I can look at someone um, and say, I want to be in relationship with you so that you are your very best version of yourself. And mm -hmm. I'm the best version of myself, then we can solve problems. And I want to be in this relationship when we get along. And I want to be in it when we don't get along. Mm -hmm. I want to be in it when I agree with your choices. I want to be in it when I don't agree with your choices, because I want you to be your best self. And I believe you want me to be my best self. So I, I, I talk about love as that leadership tool these days. And Mm -hmm. They don't tell you to do that in new president schools. No. <laughs> so maybe I'm doing it wrong, but that's the no. that's what I have left: hope and love. Yeah, I uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I join you on that journey. Um, you know, also in my prior experiences, we as organizations um, talked a lot about love. I um, was the a beneficiary of having uh, one of my favorite and one of my most meaningful mentors, Larry Roper, former mm -hmm. vice president or vice provost for student affairs at Oregon State, he yeah. always encouraged us to to bring love into the equation. So it's just really affirming to hear you also invoke that. And yeah. we need to bring that into all of our school, you know, every in, in graduate programs, I think we yes. can and should be talking about this notion of love and, and uh, as an unconditional commitment, I think what you described, right, right? In, in any context, what would that look like? Yeah, so yeah, I was gonna say, as we continue to talk about love, um, how do we situate lo uh, love with, again, the heaviness of the work? Um, so as I look around, um, you know, and see my student affairs colleagues, and I think about, you know, um, just the things that are asked and uh, that are asked of us, uh, particularly, I mean, it was happening before the pandemic, but I think, again, the pandemic accelerated a lot of reflections for many of us. Um, how do we reconcile love of other and love of self how do we reconcile the things you know the, just what we're asked to do in service mm -hmm. of our students and how do we stay healthy um in doing that work um what advice would you give us around uh lifting up the heaviness of the work um and and staying in that space of love yeah there's a saying, um, and I'm going to not entire, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it's something like grief shared is halved and joy shared is doubled. And so, um, and I think of that with this question because you have to find people around you with whom mm -hmm. you can share the heaviness of the work. 
um, mm -hmm. and you can share your heaviness with them and they can share your, their heaviness with you. And it is about an intentional network of people, not, I'm not big on just venting and complaining. Mm -hmm. That's not my thing. There's, there's mm -hmm. definitely a place for it. It's yes. not my particular thing, but whatever your thing is, find the people with whom you can share that and share that so that they carry some of it with you because mm. it is too much to carry now. I, I would say even nine or 10 years ago, you could carry most of that stuff. And, you know, you hear about the lonely leader at the top, mm -hmm. you could be lonely a few years ago you can't afford to be lonely leading now it's just too much it's not healthy it's not good for your own um, mental health and well-being so you have to find people who you can share the heaviness with mm -hmm. you have to hold space I you know yeah. one thing I'm thinking about a lot is how do you hold space so very often I'll start my cabinet meeting mm -hmm. with tell me what you're bringing into this space that's wow. going to that we're going to have to acknowledge, honor, and deal with before we get to the work. So creating mm. that space by intention and meetings, because we're all human beings, we're all Absolutely. bringing something with us, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so how do we acknowledge that and hold space for that to be mm -hmm. present, which I think diffuses it a little bit, or at the very minimum, it says to your colleague, I'm going to hold some of your grief or difficulty mm -hmm. or challenge with you. At the same time, I worry that it's it's almost like we're not allowed to feel joy these oh, days, that it's yeah. a, sort of an Olympics to see who's having the worst time. And and I, I don't think that's healthy either. We've all mm -hmm. got something in our lives to be joyful about. And, you know, if nothing else, if you've got food on your table and a roof over your head, celebrate that. But I think mm -hmm. we're fortunate to have so much more than that. Mm -hmm. We have students, We, as I said, we just got through commencement. You can't watch students walk across a stage and not feel joy. I mean, you just, you just can't. And mm -hmm. yeah, I know the troubles it took to get some of them to that stage, right. but feel joy. And in the same way, I encourage people and I try myself to share my challenges, share your joy, invite mm -hmm. someone into your office for that happy dance with you. And, and those may seem like Pollyanna things. But if yeah. you can find 15 minutes of joy to share with someone each day, it makes your day better. Um, there's a E.E. E. Cummings quote that I thought of when we were talking before the recording, mm -hmm. talking about students as sacred. And E.E. E. Cummings wrote, we do not believe in ourselves until someone reveals that deep inside us, something is valuable, worth listening to, mm -hmm. worthy of our trust and sacred to our touch and yeah. we deserve that we are all sacred and worth listening to and worthy mm -hmm. of trust and so we have to not only open ourselves to receive that from others but we have to believe it about ourselves and I think women in particular struggle with believing that yeah about ourselves um and just as we are, we are enough. Yeah. And there are many days, um, to, Mamta, Mamta, <laughs> where I have to say that to myself, you are enough. I have mm -hmm. bracelets that say you are enough. But I think real recuperation and rejuvenation comes from giving the compassion you give to others to yourself. Yeah. You know, over this past year, um, as I've, you know, transitioned careers and roles, you know, I've um, in, in different spaces of reflection, one of the things that has actually lifted me up is this idea that whatever my journey is, is a, an ancestral experience that's healing. Mm -hmm. So I might not know what, what that healing was generations before me, but something from the past is healing by virtue of my existence. I love simply. that. And, and, and so... Um, I think sometimes, um, I and I, you know, again, in, in my own cultural traditions, you know, this, this notion of, of challenging time, right? We think mm -hmm. of time from our existence or even right. plus or minus, you know, but if we transcend that to generation and even multiple generations now, what would that arc look like? And then how could we experience hope kind of in the way that you're talking about, which is um, just so deeply moving. So you've asked us to think about joy and I would, I would love to hear 
and learn from you how you have found or claimed joy on your journey. Yeah. Well, I confess that commencement is my favorite time of year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so I do, I just find joy in that. I find joy in asking consent and when granted hugging my students, um, but that's important. I find great joy in that. I find joy in meeting with faculty and staff to work on the strategic plan. And I know someone's like, oh, something's wrong with this. <laughs> But I find joy in locking arms with folks and saying, we're going to vision a new way forward. That brings me joy. I also, like like you, find a lot of joy in thinking about how I got here. And mm -hmm. so um, I, there's an article that I wrote, and I put it in the chat for you, Mom Chai. It's called The Whisper of Dangerous Memory. And for about 18 months, I was really compelled with this notion mm -hmm. of why am I a hopeful human being. And I mm -hmm. was just thinking about my ancestors who survived the Middle Passage. Yeah. What was their experience when they landed on these shores? Did they have any hope? Mm -hmm. And how does that get translated through DNA? Mm -hmm. and what does that mean? And I think about that every every yeah. day like how yeah. can I literally be as the poem says the hope and the dream of the slave that is that is me and I carry that both heavily on my shoulders mm -hmm. because I mm -hmm. owe that to the ancestors but I also carry it gently in my hand and in my work each and every day people quite literally died for yeah. us to be in these roles yeah. mm -hmm. And what a privilege and responsibility it is to honor their lives through our work today. And while that sounds very heavy, it, it also does give me joy because it means that when I am long gone from this place, there will be young people who I hope will have an opportunity because of something yes. I did. Absolutely. And that that brings me joy. So when I think about the work, what can I do to create that pathway for someone who will never know my name? And that, that brings me joy as well. I love that. What can I do to create a pathway for somebody who will never know my name? That is just such a powerful Thank you. reflection. And I'm so grateful for you. Um, you. So I have one last question for you. Yeah. Um, I could talk to you for days. Um, we could talk all day. We should <laughs> tell like, the audience yes, yes. that we chit chatted for a long <laughs> time before I, I kind of barreled on <laughs> just no, this it's, conversation. It's, I'm sorry, Mom. Uh, no, I was, <laughs> you know, it just, I mean, to, to feel this instant, the, the, it is such a testament to who you are that on an instant, somebody can feel like they have known you for a lifetime. And you so do that again, as well, thank Mom, you. So I, uh, we were met. <laughs> And we have finally um, lived into our um, <laughs> destiny meeting one another. Oh, uh, yes, I, I will receive that for sure. Um, so my last piece is what advice would you, you know, you have a lot of student affairs colleagues listening. What advice would you offer, um, you know, an advice, a meditation? What would you offer this group? Mm. Wow. So again, I want to start with offering gratitude. Because mm -hmm. I don't yes. think people see the work with the deep respect with which it deserves to be seen. You quite literally keep our students alive. You get to articulate learning outcomes because deep, powerful learning happens in that space. And I know it's hard. It's harder today, I would argue, than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to my colleagues is, I see you and I'm just so grateful for you. I'm grateful for every hand you hold, for every tear that you wipe. I am, I am truly grateful. So that would be the first thing that I would say. And I would say, be encouraged. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to see the power of your work when you're in the mm -hmm. middle of it. it. When you're on a discipline committee, it's hard to yeah. see the power of that work. Yeah. But every one of those little encounters alters the trajectory of that person's life. And even if you can't see it today, when I look back on my life, um, 
what stands out or not any big moments per se, Mm -hmm. what stands out are those little moments when someone quietly encouraged me, when someone says, I believe in you, when someone says, I think there's more there. Those are the moments that I draw on and think of. And so I would encourage our, our colleagues and friends to just know you are changing lives in powerful ways every mm-hmm. day, every day. And people remember that. I remember mm-hmm. the people when I was a student, I tell folks I arrived at Williams College with a Jerry curl and a Southern accent. Those were my two mm-hmm. assets that I took to college. <laughs> um, and I remember the people who made me feel like, I had value Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what our colleagues do every day. So be encouraged and to each and every one of you, you are enough Mm. just as you are, you Mm. are enough. Oh, wow. Thank you again, President Hinton. I can't think of a better, a better way to, to round out our conversation um, I'm going to have to find a way to have you uh, on the podcast again and, you know, with it. additional conversations. Um, so um, again, your spirit um, and energy on student affairs now, just you've really added um, to, to the joy Thank in you, our Mom. space. <laughs> you bring the joy. You We're only as good as the people we surround ourselves with. Oh. And you draw light and good and energy because that's who you are. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate you. So as we, as we close out, um, I want to be sure and thank our sponsor, Simplicity. Um, Simplicity, we appreciate your support. Um, And a little bit more about Simplicity. Simplicity is a global leader in student services technology platforms with a state-of-the-art technology that empowers student institutions to make data-driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institution, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, including, but not limited to career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success and accessibility services. To learn more, visit simplicity.com or connect with Simplicity on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, Much love and a huge shout out to my colleague, Nat Ambrosi, the producer for the podcast, who does all of the behind the scenes work to make us look good and sound good. Thank you so much, Nat. And friends, if you're listening today and not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please visit our website at studentaffairsnow.com and scroll to the bottom of the homepage to add your email to our MailChimp list. While you're there, please be sure to check out our archives. Once again, I'm Mamta Akapati. So much love and gratitude to everyone who is watching and listening. Please make it a beautiful week that honors your soul, spirit, and ancestral wisdom. Thank you all, my friends.